when you're in a really dominant position on the chessboard, sometimes the best thing to do is actually to allow your opponent some minor tactical wins. Give back some material. Exchange your rook for a knight and a pawn. Give up a pawn for a tempo. Right. If you can expedite an end game that you see will be winning, it's often worth losing those minor battles in the name of this broader strategic vision. Right? Get all the pieces off the board, march your pass pawn down the A file. Um, you know, ultimately, it's not the points that matter, it's whether you uh, get the other person's king or not. The global financial elite have had a dominant position for centuries, and they have a very clear end game that they're looking at, that they're aiming for. Right, this kind of transhumanist utopia slash dystopia where a certain class decides how the resources of the world will be distributed. Right, this kind of great economic reset type thing, Agenda 2030, etc. And the masses will be increasingly deindustrialized. Um, they will be replaced by automation, AI, and robotics. They will live in pods and eat bugs and stuff like that, people say. And people often believe that nationalism is the natural antithesis of this globalist agenda. And that's a plausible perspective. It's also like a, I think, cartoonishly naive way of thinking. But it is the natural thought that the masses will come to globalism bad, therefore nationalism good, even if nationalism, you know, even if it was successful, could not address the very global problems that the globalists talk about all the time, you know, threats from uh, dangerous technologies, rogue regimes coming up with engineered bioweapons, drone warfare um, gets cheaper. You can use AI to like have facial recognition. You can wipe out certain ethnic groups potentially with drones it, using these technologies. Uh, nanoscale gray goo, general artificial intelligence, uh, breakout scenarios. You know, a lot of these things, we don't know about the ontological possibility of them, but epistemically, these things are possible Right? If we don't know whether or not AI could get out of hand and be a danger to mankind, then it's possible in one sense. You know, and experts disagree as to how likely that is. So anyway, globalists will use these sorts of arguments. They'll use arguments about environmental sustainability, some of which are valid, some of which are hyped up. Global warming seems to be hyped up, but resource scarcity, very real. Peak oil, very real. I mean, it would be impossible for that not to be the case in an infinite growth economic paradigm. You can't keep consuming the finite resources that exist on the planet. Already, you know, rare earth minerals are inaccessible uh, for a lot of nations. A handful of powers control, you know, lithium supplies, etc. There are, it's not just about oil, right? There are a lot of materials that industrial scale global economic life depends on um what do nationalists say about things like that the danger and it also as like fresh water becomes <laughs> uh increasingly a commodity that people fight over that's the way that china has you know their has conducted their kind of geopolitics to a degree controlling water supplies you know turkey has done the same thing big regional players are controlling water supplies. That's the natural kind of nationalist tendency. Monopolize these natural resources for your group, right? Secure the interests of your group. Globalists address that and nationalists don't actually have a great response to these sorts of things. 
But believe me, I know, because I've talked with many nationalists over the years, and they have a tendency just to like pretend these are non-issues. So anyway, that's just to say that even if nationalists won, like they wouldn't be addressing global existential threats. Uh, they wouldn't be addressing the possibility of nuclear war, etc., in the way that globalists are. Not that they're doing so efficiently or in they're going about it in the right way, but at least they recognize valid problems. Now, you know, I'm not taking their side, the globalists, but um, regardless, some people think that nationalism is the natural antidote to globalism, so they want to support nationalist policies. But the global financial elite has always been very good at playing both sides, right? They uh, support political candidates on both sides of the aisle so that no matter who wins the election, their guy is in power. They supported both sides during the French and American revolutions. They're generally on both sides of all of these major conflicts. They make a lot of money through that, through lending to governments in uh, wartime. So they know how to control opposition. They want controlled opposition, not uncontrolled opposition. You know, if they wanted to, they could induce the major financial institutions, could induce the tech companies um, to censor any and all dissonant talk, right? They could get much stricter. Why don't they? Why do they allow it to the extent that they do? Well, if you suppressed it entirely, the millions of people who have been imbibing these nationalist narratives over the past 10 years, especially online, but like it's been a gradual process. And there's always been people who have these beliefs. If you shut them up entirely and don't allow them legitimate uh, platforms to discuss these issues, then they'll turn to less legitimate means. And, you know, if you can afford to simply boil the water slowly you know, allow people to think that they have a chance of victory, allow them those tactical wins, seemingly, then, like, as long as you still have that dominant position and that winning end game, that's what you should do. Don't leave all the pieces on the board. Don't allow unforeseen eventualities. Um, you know, control opposition. Allow people to think that they're winning. And keep their attention focused on things that are ultimately not going to be productive. You know, we know that the norm when nationalist revivals happen is that a pseudo-nationalist regime ends up being in charge. Somebody paid off by the bankers ends up forming the policies. Their agenda gets passed. Nationalist policies are put on the back burner. And yeah, here and there you get minor wins but the overarching tendency is still in the direction of that kind of 2030 agenda. You know, the globalists are still getting what they want. And that's all that matters to them. They're getting that end game that they're looking for. So I think, uh, in general, thinking about possible ways of changing. Uh, that global dominance of existing financial institutions, we have to think outside of the paradigms that they are encouraging. They're encouraging this nationalist versus globalist rhetoric because the nationalist side is like losing at an intellectual level on various levels. And his people don't have like really solid moral arguments for why we ought to respect, you know, the rights of ethnicities collectively but not individuals within those ethnicities. To give an ethnicity, like an ethnostate, sovereignty is to say that the people living under that ethnostate themselves do not have sovereignty at a certain level. And it's like you have to accept a bunch of arbitrary and intuitive uh, presuppositions to make that case. Now, high IQ people don't think with their gut. They think with their intellect and, you know, they may be mistaken in trusting too much in abstract reasoning, like many liberals trust too much in abstract arguments about equality and so forth that don't make intuitive sense, but they've rationalized to themselves. But 
regardless of that fact, like it is what it is. And yeah, um, the intellectual argument for nationalists is not being made cogently enough. It's not being spread rapidly enough. Europe, North America, the West is facing demographic winter. <laughs> We're not going to have nationalist revivals after the next 30 or 40 years. It will be demographically impossible. If anything is going to be turned around at the national scale, it would have to be turned around very rapidly. And I don't see that happening. You know, the people that are supported are usually more towards the middle of the row, centrist, right-wing centrists, not extremists who are actually going to put in place policies that could make a difference. So I don't have a lot of hope in nationalist revivals. I think they will happen. They are happening and will continue to happen for the next few years because actually, yes, it is in the interest of the global financial elite. I think they're sacrificing some material to get the, end, the winning end game, which they already have locked in. So you have to look at a broader level to address the situation. You have to think, why is Europe facing this demographic winter? Well, and a moral collapse. And, you know, relationships are becoming more fraught. Men and women, you know, are kind of talking past each other. Uh, marriage is collapsing. Nuclear families are collapsing. Not universally across the board, but the overarching tendency is that way. You can point to individual wins, but again, that is missing the broader point. That we have a general kind of sociological sickness that we have to address. And I, I'm skeptical that that could be addressed even by extreme far-right parties taking power in various governments. Like, okay, you incentivize birth rates. I don't know how far money, you know, giving people $10,000 when they have a child or something, I don't know how far that will actually take us because I think, you know, people are not primarily economically self-interested. They're interested in meaning in life. They're interested in broader purpose. And it's the nihilism that goes along with the modern, you know, enlightenment philosophy that is an outgrowth of the enlightenment philosophy um, that is leading to our problems, demographically, morally, economically even. So it has to be addressed at that level. Um, now, how would you do that? We lost faith in Christianity. Christianity was that underlying operating system that allowed us to do our thing for so many centuries. We lost faith in that because science seemed to conflict with it. And people who want to say that that was not the case... I think that's very difficult. I mean, there are a lot of empirical claims in the Bible that seem to be false when compared to available scientific evidence. And you can engage in like, you know, apologetics on behalf of the biblical worldview there. Uh, I just don't, I, you know, I look at those arguments and I'm not persuaded. I was never really persuaded by like, you know, biblical archaeology and stuff like that. They seem to be knockoff like low-grade versions of legitimate archaeology, which I also follow. And it's just not compelling. It's not convincing, not intellectually rigorous. There's a reason why it failed and wishing it didn't fail and saying it was a mistake and we just have to go back, I think is um, the wrong perspective on hi how history operates. Um, I think we will not have a sense of meaning in life that is shared in common. We will not have a common concept of the common good until we address the failure of our metaphysics, the failure of our theology, the failure of our worldview in a broader sense. And that is the work that has to be done. Now, supporting nationalist politics, reporting the news, that doesn't get you there. It doesn't get you there at all. I'm not saying that no one should engage in that struggle. I'm not saying that, you know, all nationalist activism is a negative thing. I've said before, in certain countries, in certain circumstances, maybe it's for the greater good. Maybe it's worth investing your energy into. 
But I think what we really need is a fundamentally new worldview that assimilates what we know scientifically with the metaphysical heritage of our civilization. That metaphysical heritage is the Platonic Aristotelian metaphysical system. There is no major competitor. So, I mean, that's why I have the Plato reading groups. That's why I want to start a school where people can come and study the Platonic texts, reevaluate the metaphysical foundations of our civilization, and work towards building a coherent alternative to give people a sense of meaning again. It's not that, you know, you get meaning just by having schools and stuff like that. It starts in that rigorous intellectual environment, somewhat ascetic environment. It starts in places like that, in the Pythagorean communities or the early Christian communities. It starts in those like concentrated centers of spiritual reformation, and then it spreads from there if it's successful. So, you know, I don't get excited when I see Kanye West talk about a certain subject. I'm, it's just, it doesn't thrill me. I think that's in line with the overall rise in nationalist sentiments that has been allowed to take place as, and is being, to a certain extent, encouraged. That's part of that broader trend, but it's not addressing the root causes of our crisis. It's a crisis of meaning. It's a crisis of values. And to address it, we need to look for a broad, coherent worldview. Only philosophy can do that for us. Philosophy and all the other sciences together. But many people would like to dispense with philosophy or say that like something else should be at the top of the pyramid, right? Plato was wrong. You don't need philosopher kings. Instead, what you really need is like engineer kings or you need, you know, some other uh, specialist class to be making the calls. I think that's ridiculous because you can't define any of the other disciplines without the tools of philosophy. All the other sciences evolved out of philosophy. It's kind of just what you have to use. It's the only inherently interdisciplinary subject. Um, so it's important and it is the way out of our current crisis. I've dedicated myself to that. And I see that people who invest too much energy in like hot button political issues don't invest their energy where it's actually needed, where we can actually make a difference. So I'm not saying that like, it's a bad thing that Kanye West or some other major internet celebrity uh, talks about certain issues, not necessarily a bad thing. But on the other hand, like the average medieval peasant had similar opinions, you know, they had prejudices about certain groups. Uh, they had ideas that nationalists would approve of nowadays, some nationalists, and yet they still lost all their power. They still lost their land. They were relegated to working in urban slums. You know, the whole process of industrialization destroyed the traditional way of life of the European peasantry. So being red-pilled didn't help the peasants. Being red-pilled is not going to help all of these powerless people on various internet platforms unless there is some useful work that they can engage in. People want to change the entire nation when they themselves have no power. And it's ridiculous. We know that the policies that get enacted are the ones that wealthy people support, not the majority. You changing the mind of the majority. It's not like that matters, you know, nothing. It has some significance, but um, it doesn't guarantee victory. And I think LARPing that you can change the country, that you can change, you know, how government operates. You can change all these things at a super high level when you currently have very little power and you only have 30 to 40 years to get these massive changes enacted at the, the national level, I think it's, it's the wrong place to put your faith. It's the wrong place to put your energy. 
You need to do things, you need to focus on things that you can actually do, right? You can't change national policy. You can't, not right now. And you would have to get way better at what you've been trying to do on, with your online activism really quickly to actually make a difference that way. And I'm, I doubt whether it's even possible, as I said, without you know, bringing about this revolution in worldview. That is the work that matters. I think we need more discussion of that character. We need to support institutions that are trying to bring that about. By the way, just a little update. I did finally get some stuff built up here. Um, so I have, this will be like a utility building. Uh, I'm having a well drilled up here. I'll have power run up here. I'll build some cabins uh, relatively cheaply. I've done like everything that I can, I think, given my resources, given, you know, early life choices that I made. Um, I've done everything I can to be able to have a place where people can, you know, study true philosophy and bring about that revolution and worldview that we truly need. And I don't want to characterize it as an absolute revolution. I mean, at the end of the day, I think the basic idea behind Western civilization was right. We just got too many, we got hung up on too many details and asserted things that we didn't actually know. Like Platonism was generally true and Christianity is true, but not necessarily in every particular. And we have to, you know, use the scientific method and have an evolving epistemology uh, and method that's communal uh, that is based in well-designed institutions. So it's not an absolute revolution. It's just like, how do we fix our worldview collectively? I'm looking at how to do that. Not that I claim to be the only person on the right track. I'm willing to talk to anybody who thinks that this project is the most important thing. Hopefully I, I made the point that I wanted to make here. You guys understand where I'm coming from. Um, yeah, it's, I've seen the, the quips that like, you know, how are you going to say that this is a bad thing? Somebody naming them, quote unquote, um, in such a big way. So many people listening. Well, I've seen stuff like this before. I don't get too excited about it because there's like, <laughs> okay, red pill the masses. Step one, step two, question mark, step three, profit. That's what I see here. And it like, Unless you have a path to victory and a, a, like a solution to how you get to your end game, then you might just be getting excited over tactical wins that are actually part of your opponent's strategy. Um, and how do you ensure against that possibility? I think the instinct will be to push it away, push it aside and say, come on, don't be a party pooper. That's, I think, the instinct here hopefully see why that's not a good thing, why it might be counterproductive. Thank you guys for listening. God bless.